I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, March 23rd Committee of the Whole meeting for the City of Hopkinsville. Uh, call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Francis? Here. Councilmember Smiley? Here. Councilmember Marsh? Here. Councilmember Crabtree? Here. Councilmember Craig? Here. Councilmember Martin? Here. Councilmember Wilcox? Here. Councilmember Meek? Councilmember Limeberger? Here. Councilmember Keel? Here. Councilmember Bell? Here. Councilmember Handy? Present. And we do have a quorum. Thank you. And uh, Councilmember Meek did contact us. Unfortunately, he is on vacation, so he is not here tonight. Um, so moving along, if everyone would please stand the can for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right, jumping right in. Uh, first thing is approval of minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. 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 I got. Uh, <coughs> Did you forget my name? I, yes, I did. My name's Amy. Amy, Amy uh, Councilmember Council Craig, Craig Councilmember uh, <laughs> Martin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Jump right down to administrative matters. I'd like to call on Lee Conrad and Mac Majors. Let's know about our insurance. All right. If you all will turn to page five of your packets, I've just been given the two minute warning. <laughs> by the mayor. <laughs> but I believe Councilmember Keel is actually the presiding member. So I'm sorry, you're all so well, Mayor. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So, page five of your packets. Um, my name is Lee Conrad. I'm with Higgins Insurance. I want to thank you all very much for the opportunity to be here and the opportunity to work with the city. It's um, really one of the most enjoyable accounts I work on, and uh, you guys should be very proud of your staff. I I apologize to the members of the council who have been here in previous years. This is a, going to be a similar overview of your program, but it's it's because we've got about, what, half of the council and a new mayor uh, to just kind of bring up to date on to uh, what the, the insurance does for the city and um, what we're seeing in trends and changes. So I will be brief, um, and I apologize. I'll even leave before Max starts. I've got to get back to the soccer field, but it is a joy to be here, and I'll, I'll do my best to be brief. That first uh, page in the, uh, the first slide that says coverage summary. What I want to do right now is just explain to, to, to the new members and just to remind everybody else what it is your all's insurance does for you. Um, it's not much different uh, at a high level from your homeowner's policy or those of you all who own a business, your business owner's policies. If a storm blows your building over or takes a roof off, you've got property insurance to, to, to fix that. Uh, your liability insurance, <clears throat> if somebody gets hurt or you all cause property damage to somebody else, just like a homeowner's policy, it'll pay that third party for that claim. Where it gets a little different is, is, is when we look at that section that says public officials. And that's what ensures you all in your roles as council members, the mayor, and your all's uh, professionals, police officers, firefighters, and, and what they do. And what, the way I describe that insurance, what makes it different, general liability is going to cover the city if you all damage somebody else's property or cause somebody else a bodily injury. The public officials coverage, or if you serve in a private entity or a nonprofit, directors and officers, um, it's going to cover you for decisions, not even right or wrong decisions, but what I call decisions people don't like. So I'll pick on Tab Brockman because he's not here. Um, <laughs> But let's say Tab chooses um, George Jones or George Strait, pardon. George Jones wouldn't be able to perform anymore, I don't guess. But George Strait instead of um, Earth, Wind, and Fire for, for the Summer Salute Festival. And that really upsets some people. And somebody decides to sue the city because they don't think George Jones should be the person to perform. Well, that decision they don't like, that's where that public officials coverage kicks in. It's, it's very unique to organizations like yours where, you know, People are scrutinizing decisions. Um, what it doesn't cover is it doesn't cover property damage or bodily injury. That's what your general liability does. It also doesn't cover intentional acts. If you know you're going to cause something to happen, it doesn't cover that. Meaning um, it's, it's tough to come up with an example, but on the general liability, an intentional act would be if you intentionally harm somebody. Um, that would be an intentional act that's not covered. 
don't want to get too into the weeds on that because each claim stands on, own, on its own. But for you all as council members, particularly the new ones, that public officials is really important because that's what gives you all the comfort to know that you can make decisions and you're not going to be held, you know, uh, you're not, you could be held liable, but there's some insurance coverage there for it. And then automobile is not going to be much different than your personal auto policies. Uh, workers' compensation insurance, the city is just like every other entity. If you have an employee in Kentucky, you have to have workers' comp insurance. This covers your employees in the event that they get injured uh, on the job. It also covers you all if you get injured in, in your all's roles as council members. So uh, that's what that covers. Cyber liability is something that I think I was referred to as the Grim Reaper whenever I talked about it last year. Um, it has, that environment has improved some, um, partially because the market has improved a little. The carriers aren't as worried about things that have happened in the past. But you all have also worked really hard. Uh, when Mr. Grace was in his transition out, Mr. Anderson was joining the team uh, in the IT department. You all worked really hard to beef up your security measures to help you be able to continue to buy that coverage as well as increase your limits. We'll go to the next page. The next page is the workers' compensation claims data. And this is just an illustration of what we review with your safety committee every month. Um, I'm a part of that committee that includes all of your department heads, including your safety, your safety officer, uh, Mr. Gabar and others. And we keep on top of your workers' compensation claims. There's no other line of coverage that you all buy, that you all control more, uh, the cost more than workers' comp. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. But this is something, this is a slide that you all should be very proud of. You all have worked really hard over the years to create a, surf, a safe work environment for your employees, and you've done that. It helps them be able to go home at night safe to their families, uh, and it also helps you all to be able to, to keep competitive costs on your workers' comp. Um, you all spend about $150,000 a year on workers' comp right now. The insurance carriers want to try to underwrite to about a 50% loss ratio. They want to pay out about half of what you pay them in claims. You all have averaged much better than that in the last three years. And that includes us at about $100,000 with three months left in your policy this year. So again, that's something to be very proud of and it does not happen on accident. Um, the next page, current insurance program, goes down your all's premiums for the last uh, four years. If you look at the property and casualty, that includes your your property, your liability, your public officials, your law enforcement liability, your automobile, your umbrella. Um, that, uh, that cost, you are actually almost right in line with where you were in 2019. Um, in 2024, we will go through competitive bid and um, we will look at alternatives uh, or you all will look at alternatives then. You will go through a competitive bid process. It'll be opened up and um, We'll, we will bring quotes um, or agents will bring quotes next year, us and anybody else who wants to participate. I would say the timing on that is really good. We are in the midst of the hardest property insurance market that any anybody in our office, and we've got some people who are close to 50 years of experience, has ever seen. And whenever I say hard, I mean carriers are raising rates and they are also scared of risk. So not only are you getting people are getting hit with rate increases, but carriers are also being very, very selective on what they choose to insure and what they choose not to. The good news that you all have with your renewal, hopefully up, upcoming in July, is we have been tentatively, and I emphasize tentatively, uh, barring what happens in the next 60 days or so, um, a, uh, a commitment to limit any rate increase to 5% or less. Now that's notwithstanding budget increases, values on your property going up, that sort of thing. <clears throat> the next, uh, the next uh, coverage there, workers' comp, you'll look and you'll see that your premium is significantly lower than it was just four years ago. And that is not by accident. That is a direct reflection of the mod rate. Again, I told you that's the one coverage that you all have the most direct impact on the cost by limiting claims, keeping a safe work environment. You're all safe work environment has driven that cost down significantly. And that mod rate out to the right, it's a, it's a credit or a debit. If it's above a one, 
then they're multiplying your premium by that number and it increases it. <clears throat> the flip side of that is if you have a credit mod, that 0.79 that you currently have, you're getting a 21% credit. Um, the lowest, just about the lowest mod I've ever seen will be your mod for next year, 2023, 2024. We, are, we already know what that number is. It will be a 0.6. That is almost unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, so that will result, it may not be dollar for dollar, <clears throat> rate changes, um, your payroll going up or down will impact the premium, but you will see a 40% credit on your workers' compensation insurance for next year. So you all will uh, almost certainly see a significant decrease in that cost. So again, that's not by accident. It's due to your all's leadership and your hard work. So, and lastly, the cyber liability, I mentioned that earlier. Um, that's a coverage that we put in place as standalone coverage starting back in 2018. Municipalities and um, are a ripe target um, because they know that you all have to be able to be up and functioning, functioning. So they would love to hit you with a ransomware attack, that sort of thing. We did increase those limits from 1 million to 2 million this year. And again, that would not have been possible without you all beefing up your security measures. And so um, again, I want to thank you all for your continued um, partnership. Uh, the team that you all have in place is outstanding. They're great to work with. Uh, the mayor, as far as I can tell from the insurance world, has transitioned in well and, and has, has jumped right in. And I know that each of you all are working hard, too. So we appreciate all your time, and I'll answer any questions. Ms. Francis? I got one. Yes, um, Just for the new people, could you tell them the contact number? The contact number? Well, we are Higgins Insurance, and our phone number is 270-886-3939. <laughs> Our website is www.higgins-ins.com. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know there's people watching, so I like that plug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kelvin Crabtree. So, Lee, I've got a question. Um, you talked about the mod rate being at 0.60, being very low, and that, based on a lot of, uh, of different variables, that potentially could really reduce our, mm -hmm. our rate there. Would it be your recommendation for us to consider taking some of that savings and continue to roll that back into uh, the safety program to, to continue to improve it? You know, there's, there's a lot of things you can do with that. Um, there are companies that dedicate a, a certain percentage to safety. Um, you know, I would always recommend continuing to invest in safety. I know that one of the one of the things that you all, with the uncertainty of the pandemic that was that was cut initially, was the safety officer that you all contract with. When we came out of the pandemic, knowing that everything was going to be at least stable financially, you all brought that back in. Um, the safety committee is 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 a very active group. Uh, we meet monthly. We met, uh, I guess, earlier this week. <coughs> And um, the, the work they do where they review every single recordable accident and they talk about the root cause of it and, and those things is, is really why you've gotten to this point. So I, I wouldn't tell you no, certainly not. Anything else? Councilman Crabtree, we do put approximately $20,000 in a safety budget uh, along with our safety consultant that we have with us for 20 uh, hours per month. Um, they do inspections, things like that. Those are the things that have really helped us get to where we are right now. We've also been very fortunate. You notice the 2019, 2020 numbers really were a direct effect of, a, of, of two or three specific incidences. Right. That, that, that's why that went so high. Okay. Last thing I'll say, when he says so high, that's still a, a good mod rate considering two catastrophic claims um, because um, those were tough years but uh the 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 thing that i guess i'll <clears throat> close with is that that rates it's a, it's a complex algorithm but it's not complex in the sense that if you see two sub twenty thousand or around twenty thousand dollar year uh, twenty thousand dollar claims years for an entity your size i mean that puts you in the top one percent of the top one percent probably and the, the the claim that's moved the needle a little this year uh, you know, don't want to discuss specifics, but it of the most unavoidable claims you could ever imagine, it was 100% 
unavoidable. There was nothing that could have been done to prevent it. Hmm. Anything else? else? Conrad? Thank you, Thank Lee. You all. And, and my compliments to your yeah. IT crew with the picture of you up here on the screen. Oh, I remember, that's, I, that's remember about 12 years old. I remember meeting this <laughs> guy. I remember meeting that guy at uh, Leadership Hogginsville in yeah. 2007. Is that yeah, Lee? Yeah. That, that's oh, Lee. Yeah. I know yeah, some of y'all may have been confused. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and so we'll invite Mr. Majors up now. Uh, no pictures of me, for sure. <laughs> Uh, good evening. My name is Mac Major. I'm also with Higgins Insurance. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to provide you, you all with an update on the benefit program here at the city of Hopkinsville. I just want to, first of all, take this opportunity to thank you. I've been involved in this for 30 years, and um, it's one of my favorite accounts to work with. I worked with a lot of different administrations. And uh, for those of you that are new, uh, just want to take an opportunity to take a 10,000 foot look at kind of what we're doing. Uh, the city of Hopkinsville basically started a health insurance company and it, it's, it's been ongoing before I even uh, started assisting the, the city with its benefit program. So for decades, it's managed an insurance company that's provided health insurance benefits to city employees. And I am 100% convinced that that is the most, uh, <coughs> economical, comprehensive way to provide benefits to city of Hopkinsville employees. We, we for the past uh, 15 years or so, we've partnered with Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield to administer uh, our claims, which has been a huge help because of their discounts with our local provider community. Um, what, what, what makes self-insurance different from traditional insurance? You know, when you buy health insurance in the marketplace, an insurance company establishes a premium or a rate, and it's it's made up of, of several things. It's made up of they have to charge you to administer the plan. They have to charge you to reinsure the plan in case there's catastrophic loss. They have to pay your claims. They have to, there's some premium taxes that are due, and there's an insurance company profit that they'd like to make every year. And in the traditional sense, that's packaged in a rate and you pay that premium and, and that individual or business takes on no risk and they just pay the premium for 12 months. And then in 12 months it changes and it usually goes up. Um, today more than ever. The city of Hopkinsville in its self-funded arrangement basically um, breaks those components down. We pay Anthem an administration fee. We pay Anthem, who is also our stop loss or reinsurance carrier, we pay them premium we buy two types of insurance. We buy something called specific stop loss insurance. It says if a claim is more than $100,000, the city's no longer responsible. So the city of Hopkinsville is on the hook for the first $100,000 of claims for every single belly button that's covered under this plan. And you may think, well, hold on a second. What if we have 40 $100,000 claims? That would be catastrophic to the plan, to the city. You buy a second form of stop loss insurance called aggregate stop loss insurance. And basically what that does is it puts an annual maximum on what those $100,000 hits can be. So that gives Kenny and Troy and Melissa and Robert uh, and the mayor sleep, I call it sleep insurance. So you can rest assured knowing that, you know, this, this health plan is not going to break the city, city of Hopkinsville. Um, this self-funded arrangement, we've had good years and we've had bad years. And we're coming off probably one of the worst claims years we've ever had. But in this self-funded arrangement, when you have the good years, you retain the money. Not Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield or Humana or United, whoever the carrier is. Your premium taxes are significantly less in a self-funded arrangement. And you just have a lot, of, lot more control and autonomy to your benefit program. So it... It's worked for 30 plus years. It's going to continue to work. Um, uh, I'm convinced of that. If we'll turn to slide eight, I think, um, just want to give you all um, a bit of a snapshot of where we are. I think it's eight. Kenny, I didn't bring my slide. In. Is it eight? Yeah. Page eight. Mm -hmm. It doesn't appear to be eight. 
It's keep going down. Uh, scroll. It is eight in our package. Is it eight? Page eight. Uh huh. Do you all have that in front of you? Mm, we do. Okay, yeah. great. Um, <clears throat> a lot of numbers here. Uh, I've been tracking your cost since the beginning of time, and I've got about ten or eleven uh, plan years of cost. Uh, you have fixed costs. Fixed costs are the admin and the stop loss premiums. Uh, claims costs are what the actual paid claims are for that contract period. And if you'll notice in 2022, our total cost was $1,061 per employee per month. That's $2.75 million for health insurance. Um, that's probably one of the, it, it is the highest claims year we've ever had. Um, we only funded about a little, a little over 950000 into the plan. So you've got a plan that's, that's dipping into reserves where we've had good years in the past. So um, what's driving that? Really two things in 2022 really, really hurt the plan. Number one, we had a really, really high number of what I call large claimants. We had 20 members on the plan that had $25,000 or more in paid claims. In a normal year, we have 10 to 14. That doesn't help. You can't control a lot of that, unfortunately. So we're, that's that's some. You, know, uh, you just hope that you revert back to what the, the norms suggest that it should be. And then our pharmacy cost in 2022 were up 39 percent. Pharmacy costs are a, it are a serious problem for everybody. When you go home tonight, if you turn on the television, within five minutes you're gonna you're gonna have a pharmaceutical company direct to consumer advertising to you. These, these medications that are out there are so very expensive. Mm -hmm. Now, during our renewal uh, negotiations back last quarter with Anthem, we, we've got some more favorable terms that are gonna help, we, we feel are gonna help bring down the pharmacy spend. As you'll notice in 2023, uh, our year to date spend is down significantly. It's down to about $925 per employee per month, which is actually creating a surplus through the first two months. So with what we negotiated with Anthem and the trend through the first couple of months, let's just hope that that continues. Um, if you'll turn to the, to the, or go to the next page, page nine, we've created this insurance company and it's important that we carry forward reserves so that when we have bad years like we just had in 2022, that there's sufficient funds to help fund these additional plan costs. Um, right now, through February or March, we have about $400,000 in, in, the, in, the, in the health trust. Um, I've always told administration from the beginning of time, we need to try to maintain about $500,000 in this, in this reserve account. Medical inflation exists. It's 10 to 12% every year. Something increases 10% 10, 10 a year in seven years, it just doubled. So we've got to sort of protect ourselves against medical inflation. The second thing that we have to prepare ourselves for is one day the city of Hoffersville may say, you know what, we need to get out of the insur health insurance business. And if we want to terminate this self-funded plan, there's going to be some exit cost that we're going to have to pay for. And I just, it's going to take about a half a million dollars to do that. Uh, so I've always said, let's try to keep a half a million dollars in it. Now, if we continue to have claims like we, we've had in the first three months of 2023, we're going to be okay. But if we go back to 2022, we're not. Uh, we've had numerous conversations with Troy, Kenny, Robert, Melissa about increasing uh uh, funds into the health trust beginning the next fiscal year, I strongly encourage that that gets serious consideration. Um, in, in years past, rather than increasing it incrementally every year, we've just, when that reserve balance got low, we just dumped funds in it. And I just think medical inflation is not going away. So um, I think that's really, really important as you all consider the budget for uh, the upcoming fiscal year. My last slide, I hope you, you see it. And I think this, this is the most important slide of all. For the last 10 years, I have 
taken about five or six public employer groups here in town or in the region and compared how does your cost stack up to everybody? How do your benefits compare to the other, your peer groups in the, in the area? And what does your contribution strategy look like compared to your peer groups? Um, at the top of, of this illustration, you, you don't, you, your health plan has the lowest cost of your peer groups in, in town. So uh, you do not have a cost problem if comparing yourselves to your peer groups here in town. So I commend you for that. Uh, your benefits, the, the scoring, the higher the, the percentage, the, the, the better the benefit programs are. The city of Hopkins is going to be very proud. Your benefits are as good as anybody's in town. So your costs are less than your peer groups and your benefits are as good or better. Um, the contribution, what city of Hopkinsville employees are asked to contribute through payroll deduction compared to others is high. Em city employees are funding about 20% of the, of the total spend and the peer group averages is somewhat less than that. So when we think about contributing or, or putting more dollars into the health trust moving forward, I think we need to start with this body, with, with city government, and see if we can forego asking employees to pay any more for it. Um, this health insurance plan is not only a recruitment tool, it's a retention tool. It is good employees are hard to find, hard to keep. And this health insurance plan is a big reason why a lot of the 250 employees here are here. And uh, the, the plan has been administered carefully and, and uh, there have been great decisions along the way when we've had good claims years. We, we haven't spent the money on other things. We've put it back into the plan. But I think it's about time that we increase that funding into that program so that we can, so we can maintain this wonderful benefit program that we're offering our employees today. I know that's a lot. Uh, and I know both he, Lee and I went over two minutes. Uh, uh, but, you know, this, this, this program's to two, three million dollars. I mean, it's it's a lot. Next to payroll, it's number two. Uh, your property, cash, and workers' compensation programs are really, really important. So, for those of you who have questions, be more than happy to answer them. You know, we're just right down the road. I know a lot of there are a lot of new faces here. If if you want to take a deeper dive in what the city's doing, and you want to schedule a time to come visit me, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you. And, and take a deeper dive into how this works. But I, I can't thank uh, City of Hopkinsville enough for, uh, for trusting Higgins Insurance. Uh, we don't take it lightly, and we greatly appreciate the opportunity to help you guys. Thank you, Mr. Majors. Uh, any, any questions on uh, the health side of things? All right, well, thank you thank very you. much. Y'all have a good evening. <clears throat> Next, we have an uh, update from the Hopkinsville Christian County Public Library. I'd like to call on Tiffany Luna. Just step right up and see what you got. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Tiffany Luna, and I'm with the Hopkinsville Christian County Public Library. And I came tonight just because I want to give you guys a quick update of things that have been going on in the library since the beginning of the fiscal year. My slide, unfortunately, <clears throat> says January 2022 to July 2023, and that is not correct. It is July 2022 to January 2023. Um, over the past six months, we have done over about 324 passports for the citizens of Christian County, which is double our total from the previous fiscal year. Um, we've had more than 1,600 children enjoying story time, um, with our youth services department and about 700 children from the ages of six to 18 um, during our epic hour programs um, that happen on Tuesday nights at five o'clock. Right now, we currently have an exhibit from the Kentucky Science Center um, <clears throat> set up in the library on the first floor. It is an exhibit that only goes to four um, libraries in the state at one time. 
So it was something that we had to apply for. We get to have it for three months. There is a play specialist who is assigned to that area and helps guide people through it all. There's about four foot tall. We, it, we call it a light work because light right is trademarked. Um, it's about that tall. And you'll see often see as many adults playing with it as you might see children. Um, <laughs> brings you back to your childhood a little bit. So that's something that's going to be um, in the library till around the end of May. What else? Um, speaking in general for the library, we have had nearly a thousand new library cards issued to patrons in the last six months. We've had over 51,000 items checked out and that circulation is based just off of physical items. We still also have about 20 to 30,000, because I can't remember the number right off the top of my head, 20 to 30,000 30, in eBooks from Overdrive um, that, are, that have been checked out in the last six months. And what we've been seeing is that <clears throat> since COVID and the reopening of our doors, mm -hmm. our circulation has shifted a little bit to some more online, but they're slowly coming back and our circulation's been picking up a lot. We've had about 28,000 people walk through the doors. That number is growing every day. Currently we have 19 computers and we've had more than 4,300 um, times that they've been accessed. So our public com computers are open to anyone who has a photo ID or a library card. You can also use our printing services and we have had great success with our mobile printing service. So you could sit here at the council meeting, upload a document to our website and then go to the library, pick it up. Um, it's a service that many people use because although I find, I believe I'm technically savvy, I do not own a printer. And when I print things, I print them at the library because I don't want to own a printer or buy ink. So it's something that people in all economic groups use and come to the library for. <clears throat> we also have Wi-Fi hotspots and those are available to check out along with laptops. So as of right now, the library has some laptops that are available to be checked out. And if you have iffy internet service wherever you lived, which is something that, as you know, in this area is not uncommon. Our Wi-Fi hotspots are available to check out. We have done about 40 outreach programs in our community for all ages. We've just started to step up our uh, outreach for adults. Um, usually when you think about libraries going out and getting into the community, you think about us in the schools. And we are there and we love to be there, but there are adults in our community that also need us. So we have been going out to Christian care communities and they've been reading, they've played, uh, they've had some activities and we're hoping that we'll be able to get out into a lot more um, of those places. We recently had a pet, pet supply food drive with, in partnership with PAD to collect supplies for our senior citizens who are having to choose between whether or not they want their medication, whether they want to eat, or whether they want to keep their pet that they've had for 10 years. Um, so we did that and Pat distributed that as um, during their, when they delivered their meals on wheels. So that was another outreach that we had recently. Our genealogy librarian, um, she as assisted around 500 patrons with special requests and appointments. She will do your genealogy research for you for a small price, um, but she will also help you with your research <clears throat> while you're in there. Um, Ancestry.com is free to the library um, and to any library users. <clears throat> so if that is a, something that you wanted to do in research, uh, we have that available at the library. We also have documents, birth records, land deeds, death certificates, marriage licenses for <clears throat> our county and the surrounding counties. Because you know, at one point, 
the county lines and the boundaries were a little iffy and they've been restructured over time. So pieces that were in Christian County at one point are now somewhere else. So we have a lot of those and we have things from the surrounding states so that you can get a full glimpse of your ancestry. I know I talk fast. So if you have, if you need me to just say it, and I will stop. Um, last, our programs, our librarians have hosted nearly 170 programs for youth ages 18 and younger with almost 4,000 participants. So that includes our story times, our playing grows, um, some of our special events. I don't know if you guys know, we had a New Year's Eve party for the kids at the library, right? the day before New Year's and it was at 12 o'clock. They came, they had a balloon drop, they had a uh, sparkling grape juice and it was delicious. I'm not ashamed to say that I had some. Um, and they had little treats and snacks and it was just a really good time for them and it was something different. Um, we also have led 33 programs for adults with a total of 323 attendees. And these are just our programs. These are do, do not include the programs that use the library as a host. So for instance, the Hopkinsville Art Guild is gonna have Paint with Pets um, next month. And they host quite a few of their um, activities at the library. We have also hosted the Daughters of the American Revolution. We just hosted the Retired Teachers Association. Um, Christian County Public Schools has have also used our facilities for their new teacher um, initiations. I said initiations, that is not, <coughs> orientations, um, for their new teacher orientations and, um, and things of that nature and also some of their prof professional development activities. So, we are not just using our facility for the things that the library wants to do. This is about the community coming in and also using whatever resources that we have available. If we can, and it's not a conflict with another group, we will definitely try to make sure that what you need is available. Um, does anybody have any questions? No. Any, any questions for Ms. Lana? All right. Well, thank you very much for your update. You. And I will back you up. I was at the New Year's Eve and uh, the sparkling grape juice was good. Sir, I'm sorry in the back. We do not do public comments at this meeting. I'm, I'm about, I have to leave. But I'm honest. I had to let somebody know. I got it back into 1221. Uh, vehicle out here in the parking lot that belongs to the city government. And I had to sit here and, and just. Like Todd, you. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Thank you, Captain the Arm. All right, moving along uh, to uh, we've got the uh, planning and zoning update. I'm going to call on Tom Britton. Let us let us know where we're at on planning and zoning. I tell you what, honesty is a great thing. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Council Members, I uh, wanted just to brief you on some of the planning activities and specifically one project that we're going to be working on. And your chairman knows I can be long-winded when it comes to planning and zoning, so he's told me three to five minutes, and I'm going to try and keep it to five minutes tops. <laughs> what I wanted to talk was kind of a piece of what we do. As you know, uh, CDS, we wear many hats, do uh, many projects and things for the city. Uh, but kind of core to our mission is our long-range <laughs> planning program, primarily because these are statutory to us. Uh, KRS designates the planning commission as having these responsibilities. Uh, one of them is developing the city's comprehensive plan, which we have to update every five years. That's the roadmap of which uh, we plan, develop for the city of Hopkinsville, as well as Christian County. Our subdivision regulations uh, which we have responsibility for developing, the commission adopts, and we enforce subdivision regulations for the city of Hopkinsville as well as Christian County. Uh, finally, the zoning ordinance, and statutorily we have several responsibilities for the zoning ordinance. That includes providing updates, providing tax recommendations to city council, 
as well as some responsibilities in administering that ordinance. Unlike the previous two, the difference with the zoning ordinance is that the zoning ordinance is an ordinance, meaning that this legislative body, the city council, ultimately decides what the contents of the zoning ordinance are. And our responsibility to you are to make good recommendations uh, for your consideration. So looking forward this upcoming year, we have several projects on the long range planning side and foremost is updating the zoning ordinance. And this is a process that we started last year and I had briefed uh, the previous council on this activity, but since we do have a new council, new mayor, thought I would update you on kind of where we are and how this process we see unfolding. Next slide, please. One of the things in working in planning and zoning for 28 or so years, I take it for granted that everybody knows what a zoning ordinance is, but the zoning ordinance is the city's primary principal tool for regulating as well as directing growth within the community. What the zoning ordinance does, it divides the city into different districts. There are a total of 13 districts in the city of Hopkinsville, mm -hmm. as well as a special use district, which addresses our 41A corridor. Those districts range from residential, commercial, professional, office, industrial. And based on which zoning district is assigned to a particular area of the city or particular parcels, that governs what can be developed in that particular area. For instance, in a residential district, you would allow residential. It could be single family. Some districts permit multifamily, but you wouldn't have commercial establishments going into residential neighborhoods. Uh, the zoning ordinance also regulates dimensional aspects of how far the house, the building has to be from the road, how high it can be, what those other setbacks might be. Uh, also regulates density, how many units can be on a lot, uh, landscaping, parking, you name it. The zoning ordinance pretty much regulates anything that goes into the development of property. So it's important from the standpoint of the commission as well as for the city to make sure we get this right because at its core, zoning provides protections to property owners and their investments in our community. So we need to make sure we are providing protection. At the same time in our regulations, we need to make sure we're encouraging growth and not prohibiting growth because if we get a zoning ordinance wrong, we can stifle development. From the standpoint of our code, how it is now, and being familiar with many, many codes and having administered several codes over the years, uh, you do have codes that are very restrictive. You have codes that are minimal. Hopkinsville is probably somewhere in the middle toward the lesser end of what uh, you would see out there. Our zoning ordinance is about 250 pages or so, I think about 175 of codified text. So it's a lengthy document. Mm -hmm. So what we have been doing uh, at the commission level with the planning plan review committee, we have been reviewing the existing zoning ordinance, identifying areas for potential revision. And we're about halfway through that initial scope review and drafting process. And what I did is I've just highlighted some areas that we're taking a look at. First and foremost, we're looking to update the uses because the use schedule that's in there, which defines what is allowable on lots, uh, was uh, last updated uh, 2006, 2005, 2006. So some uses uh, are not adequately addressed. There is EVs, electric vehicles, a lot of uses associated with that that aren't addressed by the ordinance. Uh, if you recall, some of you council addressed solar just last year. We identified that as part of this process and brought it to uh, what I think is a fairly comprehensive ordinance to council to address that issue. But we're looking at, at uses, how to make those make the most sense for our community. We're looking at the downtown, revising density standards to encourage housing, second floor and upper store occupancy looking at signage, looking at our rail corridor, the zoning there to see if there are impediments to growth and development. Uh, we're also looking at housing, trying to encourage mixed use, as well as looking at providing a mechanism to provide for the rapid zoning of properties, larger tracts as they're annexed into the city of Hopkinsville. And finally, making a code that is easier to understand as well as administer. 
in working on several zoning codes over the years, one of the tendencies as we look to develop zoning is you come back with an additional 50 or 100 pages of additional regulations. And that is not the intent of this exercise. The intent of this exercise is to identify where we may need to have some additional provisions, but as well as look at the existing provisions where we can streamline. And if there are provisions that don't make a lot of sense, maybe consider removing them if, if that's will of counsel. So just to talk timeline, we are about halfway through the process. I foresee plan review committee uh, going through this probably into about August or so. At that point, we'll start uh, kind of the review comments period as well as the drafting period, looking toward uh, potentially some public hearings toward the end of the year with possible council consideration sometime uh, first part, first quarter of next year. So basically, we're about a year out from the council receiving recommendations. Uh, in the interim, we're going to encourage dialogue. Uh, and obviously, if there are areas of the zoning code that you have an interest in or would like us to take a look at, if you could let the mayor or Troy know or contact us, and we will be glad to include that as part of our review. Mr. Chairman, I, I hope that wasn't more than five minutes. I didn't even time you, Tom. It was so right. interesting. <laughs> you got lost in your words. Any any, any questions for uh, Tom on zoning? I know we've had a few, few conversations here and there. Seeing no questions, Tom, thank you very much yes, for, sir. Thank for the you, update. Chairman. Thank you. And, and this is the, the moment I've been waiting on all night. I get to call on uh, Toby Hudson for our quarterly public <coughs> works uh, department uh, report. Morning, Chairman. Good evening. Thank you, Good evening, Council Chairman. Do I need to start this? Off to a bang. Well, there we go. There we go. Just want to take a few minutes to give you guys an update on where we're headed, where Parks and Recreation is headed in, in uh, 2023. So we'll start out by uh, start out by moving this thing forward. If I can get it to move forward, you like moving forward. There we go. There you go. Our 2023 activities and events, we're looking at a department of doing 108, 108 events and activities that is based on parks and recreation and the sportsplex together. They range anywhere from the Hopkinsville International Festival all the way to baseball, softball tournaments, volleyball tournaments. Um, goes all the way through the year, all the way down to Santa Claus is coming to town. So there's about 108 events that we're looking at for the year. Um, just a brief overview. I just want to give you a few, a uh, few facilities that we're that we're highlighting in a few events. Um, obviously, Hopkinsville International Festival, uh, Summer Salute Festival, uh, Bluegrass Splash Family Aquatic Center, formerly known as Tiebreaker Family Aquatic Center, and the Planners Bank Jenny Stewart Health Sportsplex. So, just to look at a few of those, uh, the Hopkinsville International Festival this year is live. We are at the Sportsplex. We actually begin tomorrow. 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Sportsplex on Friday, and then we are from um, 11 to 6 on Saturday. Uh, Global Village, we have six uh, six global countries who will be participating. You see those there, Polynesia, the, the Philippines, Japan, Peru, India, and Mexico. Uh, we are featuring something new this year. Uh, we are offering an international food court, so four out of the seven outdoor vendors you're going to see will have an international flair to them. Uh, we have Food from Colombia, food from Greece, food from Italy and America, obviously. So that's something new that we're starting this year. There's the, the multilingual storytime tent that you can see inside the kids zone, World Peace Wall. And then there's obviously the main stage, which will have a lot of cultural performances throughout Friday and Saturday. Um, and that is this weekend. Another one that everybody's always interested in is Summer Salute Festival, what we're having planned, what we're looking at for this year. Uh, this year, we're looking at a, at a Friday night headliner and a Saturday night headliner. So those are things that we're planning through right now. Um, and right now, we, we know we were looking at Jimmy Church as opening for the Saturday night headliner. So those names, those will be um, released in the coming weeks. Uh, they're getting close, but those will be released in the coming weeks of the actual entertainers. Um, our festival and food beverage uh, vendors. For this year, as last year, our food and beverage is already sold out. Remember, we're in the third week of March, second week of March, and we are sold out completely. <laughs> this is a August event, so we are completely sold out. Um, our merchandise vendor spots are limited. 
Um, we actually have five of those. As of the time that I speak right now, there's only five merchandise vendors still available for this festival. And then we can consider this entire festival to completely sold out. That is awesome for, for where we're at. Um, we're, we're also looking at creating a beverage area this year to kind of create a pub feel, a little bit different area in the library parking lot this year. We're going to kind of transform that a little bit and make a pub feel on that. So look for more things to come. It's going to be exciting about that. Obviously, sponsorship opportunities are available. If you're interested in any of those sponsorship opportunities, uh, you can give us a call. And then obviously we work with all our public works department, fire department, EMS, PD um, to get that done. A facility that we want to highlight this, uh, this quarter is Bluegrass Splash Family Aquatic Center, formerly known as Tiebreaker Family Aquatic Center. It's going to take a little bit of time to get that to roll off your, your tongue right. But that park will open as scheduled on May 27th of this year. Uh, we are excited about that. We have rebranded it, obviously, as, as you're aware, of Bluegrass Splash. Um, and we are working with a new management firm this year, Club and Leisure Partners. Uh, we're excited about that. Um, and we're hoping that the rebranding and the upgrading will bring a growth and promote promote positivity for the, the future to come on that. Um, and then Planners Bank, Jenny Stewart Health Sportsplex. That's another highlight we want to look at this month. For their 2023 schedule, they're going to be including pickleball and archery. Um, they're also going to be including uh, 13 basketball tournaments, which, as you see there, is the highest on record. You're going to see a lot of highest on records, okay? You're going to see a lot of that. Junior pro participation was up 10%. Volleyball participation was up 10%. Soccer participation was 48 teams, which is the highest it's ever been. And the 2022 attendance from last year was 140,000 patrons. Uh, March and April of 2023 is on track to be the highest on record compared to previous years. And our concession projections for this fiscal year are looking to be about $100,000. Um, and obviously we're adding storage. We're looking at adding storage to the building because increased numbers means increased supplies, which means increased areas need to store that. So that's just kind of a brief overview um, of what we've got, of what, what's going on. This is actually the team that gets all that done. Um, I cannot stand up here and thank you enough for each and every one of those. Um, without each and every one of those guys, this would not be possible, what you've seen tonight. So um, great, great bunch of people. Uh, enjoy it and thank them all next time you see them. So with that, are there any questions that you may have of Parks and Recreation tonight? Any questions? Seeing none, Toby, thank, thank you very you. much for such an informative uh, update. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, last thing on the administrative matters, I'm going to call on Council Member Don Marsh. Um, we have our uh, monthly agency and board uh, appointee report. Uh, got anything for us this month? Sure, yeah. We uh, just, uh, you know, of, of the five agencies that and boards that uh, have been appointed by the mayor, uh, many of them don't meet during the winter time, you know, so they have a very slack meeting schedule. I uh, was able to be with the ECC. I saw uh, Captain DeArmond in the back. So we had a, a really productive meeting with uh, ECC. And then I got a tour of ECC as well. And, you know, they have a, a fresh upgrade on their uh, server area. And so it's just increasing their productivity uh, incredibly. And uh, just a, a really great group of people that work there. I think if I could say anything for ECC, it would be that uh, they, they encourage the public to come to the police department to see what they do. It's important to be able to see where those folks are helping to respond to those emergency calls when they come in. And we've got just a, a great team of people that work in the ECC. And so I want to brag on them a little bit. Beyond that, we have uh, several senior groups that are working to uh, facilitate for seniors in, in Hopkinsville. We have, a, we have a growing senior population in Hopkinsville our age uh, the mean age of folks in Hopkinsville is, is growing. It's, it's rising in number. And so we, and as it is across the United States, but uh, these folks are working really diligently. So there's not a lot to report, but I would just like to say that um, they've been in con I've been in contact with those boards and agencies. They've contacted me. Most of those meetings start to happen in April, May through the summertime. And so we'll report back if you need. All right. Well, thank you very much, Don. Anything for Don? All right, going on now to uh, unfinished business. We have the LNN Depot property transfer. Um, 
Tom is here to answer any questions. If there's any discussion or entertain a motion, just whatever we want to do with that, um, with the LNN property transfer. I'd like to. I'll make the motion. Second. All right. And that motion is going to be to bring that back under the city. We've got uh, Councilmember Smiley, Councilmember Martin, uh, motion in a second. Does anybody have any discussion on this? All in favor by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Well, that passes. And we will move right on down to <laughs> new business. Uh, I'm going to call on Council Member uh, Natasha Francis, uh, Second Street Community Center renaming. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Neighborhood Association, Ward 1, District 1, and all the nonprofits Mr. Bates contributed to in so, so mm -hmm. many ways, uh, Mr. Bates worked hard on our community for from ma magistrate to the Kentucky Bar Association of Governor. We ask that the, we as in the community, ask that the Second Street Community Center be renamed Kenneth A. Bates Community Center. This is one way we can show our appreciation for the love he showed to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Francis. Any, any discussion on uh, renaming? Uh, if no discussion, we'll entertain a motion if we motion. want to pass that to Second. Council. Second. So I've got uh, Council Member Marsh and take your pick. I think everybody seconded that one. So all in favor, we're saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Moving right along, I'm going to call on our good friend Richard Hopper from Solid Waste to talk, talk about some solid waste truck leases. Good afternoon, Council. Chairman. Hello. And as the mayor would say, yep, you see me, I'm here for money. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to cut this kind of short. I know Councilman Keel likes for it to be kind of short. I'm not so short, we, I like to be efficient. <laughs> <laughs> when the city decided to, to limit the amount of, of banking qualified bonds on the 2023 <laughs> truck purchases, we asked Kelly uh, with Keiko what our options was. And our options was we still could close the lease through the city, but the first two million of the lease would be closed as non-taxable. The second part of it is the other two million would be at, at, at a higher rate of two, two and a half percent more interest rate than what I'm paying on the other. We run the numbers on it. It's, it'll work out fine. I just need the city to help me get this to go that way. And All right. So, any, any questions on on what we're doing? <coughs> so, this is a board that I sit on, um, uh, and at our last board meeting, um, we had uh, the mayor and Troy and, and Ms. Clayton come out and just kind of go over the numbers. Um, basically, the city gets ten million dollars bank qualified bonding potential a year. Um, when we first started the truck lease, Richard, you correct me if I'm wrong, it was running about two million. Unfortunately, inflation, yeah. those things has gone up, and we just really aren't in a position to give up 45% of our bonding capacity. Um, solid waste, we voted on it that night, and, and the board decided that the cost is, is uh, negligible enough that we could just absorb that into the budget at solid waste. Um, it, it passed unanimously at, at the solid waste board meeting. Nobody saw any issues with that. So if, if we have any other discussion, we can do that, or we can entertain a motion that we're just going to send this to uh, council on an MO, that we're going to do the $2 million bank qualified. The rest of it won't be bank qualified, and solid waste is going to absorb the debt um, that incurred. I'll make the motion to forward it to council. All right, I've got uh, Martin and Wilcox. All in favor by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Motion carries. So Next up, uh, it's going to be, I'm going to call on Council Member Chuck Crabtree. He wants to have a conversation about the sudden service station electric vehicle charging. So I'd like to ask Holly to come up and uh, while she's doing that, back early in the year, I had a local resident call me and say, hey, what is this sudden service station? What's there? I noticed the car there. What is it? What do they do? And so I reached out to Troy, got a few answers. 
<laughs> he engaged hotly, and we had quite the text messaging back and forth to get the answers. So basically, I came up with five questions, and I've shared those with Holly. So I'd kind of like her to give you a brief overview. I'd like to ask a couple of questions. And then the, the goal of this is to look at look back, look at what was done, and then as we go forward, make sure we do things better. So that's the intent of bringing this to council tonight. Thank you, Councilman Crabtree. And if I omit any of the questions that are in your um, sheet that you provided, please bring that to my attention. I think we've covered them though. Just to give you a brief history of the Southern Service Station, uh, this is a photograph that was taken probably back in the early 1930s. Um, the Southern Service Station was actually constructed in 1919. It was originally located at the northeast corner of South Main and 12th Streets, but in 1935 it was moved to its current location, which is at the corner of 9th and Campbell Street. Uh, the property was acquired by the local development corporation from the Hopkinsville Water Environment Authority in 2008. It was the city's first gas station, and as a nod to that, Mayor Carter Hendricks and his administration asked us to look at installing EV charging stations so that it could be the city of Hopkinsville's first EV charging station. So as just a brief history of the project, uh, when we undertook redevelopment, prior to starting the renovation project where it was converted to public restrooms to be used in conjunction with events that are taking place at Peace Park and Virginia Park, it sat vacant for a number of years. I should have shown some before pictures um, so that you could have seen those, and I apologize for, for overlooking that. But we had a number of volunteers that assisted us with cleaning out the property. Uh, the ceilings were caving in. Uh, there were a lot of homeless individuals who were using it as um, a place to stay. So we had a lot of trash. We had a lot of clothing that was, that was left there. Quite frequently, we had um, Stanley Engineer Fastening assisted us with cleaning it out. We had some volunteer groups out of, in the upper north east, I can't even remember what state they came from right now, but a lot of individuals assisted with trying to help us get that property ready for renovation. And then uh, we came to city council and you all authorized $48,450 out of the legacy Hopkinsville or inner city res budget to go toward the renovation of that property for public restrooms. The local development corporation also borrowed $34,953 to complete that project. HES was a partner in the project and they graciously donated the terminals that were constructed um, on those front columns as part of the EV charging station. And again, multiple volunteers that assisted. Uh, Tomas Quality Painting painted the exterior of the building at no cost to us. And then we had some um, paint that was donated by Sherwin Williams as well. So the project was completed in March of 2019. Um, and as of December 31st, there's still outstanding debt that the LDC is paying on a monthly basis of a little over $21,000. If you'll recall, the city of Hopkinsville participated in a Section 108 loan guarantee program several years ago, and that was a pledge of your future community development block grant dollars to renovate eight downtown and inner city parks. And the Sudden Service Station property was one of those properties that was utilized as a gateway entrance into the downtown area. It was to complement the streetscape work that was taking place or going to take place along Campbell Street. So the signage that was installed um, at that property is owned by the city of Hopkinsville. The LDC granted an easement so that the city could construct that signage. And so the city initially undertook the electric cost associated with that property. Uh, there's one meter on the property that serves the sign that is lit at night and that also serves the building and the EV charging stations. So the average monthly cost beginning in about 2021 is $170 in electrical fees that the city of Hopkinsville is paying. This is just a snapshot of HES's rates. Uh, these are the commercial rates effective as of uh, the 1st of March of this year. And this property is served under the GSA 1 rate. And I have um, Jeff Hurd, thank you very much, Jeff, and Dustin Love for coming. In case there are technical questions about um, kilowatts per hour and how electricity works, because I'm definitely not your person for that. 
but there's a star beside the $59 monthly charge because that is the fee that you are charged as a customer of HES. The chargers that are um, located on the columns, there is a wide range of usage. Um, it ranges from 0 0.0382 kilowatts per hour on the low end to 4.095 kilowatts per hour on the high end. They're able to track the average hours per use um, as individuals are charging their vehicles and that time ranges between one and two hours. So just to give you kind of the, the high end on what those charges will be, because there is no cost to individuals who are charging their vehicles. It is a free service that is the type of terminal that was installed. So if you take the kilowatts per hour and multiply that times two hours at the rate that is charged, you will get um, 90 cents. So it's 8.9, 8.19 kilowatts per hour times 11 cents. That's 90 cents that it costs the city of Hopkinsville each time someone charges their vehicle for two hours. Likewise, if they charge the vehicle for four hours, that cost is approximately $1.80. Now, the average monthly bill, again, is $170 with a low end ranging from $130 and a high end at $210. This is an actual snapshot of the bill from January of 2023. So the customer charge again is $59. The actual energy consumption for the EV charging terminals, the building, um, heating that and lighting it, as well as the lights on the signage, you have almost $82 in energy consumption. And then you have credits, school taxes, and a fuel adjustment. So January 2023, the bill was $184.01. There is an option. Um, Council Member Crabtree asked if there's an option for converting these terminals into a pay for use terminal. And there is an option. And um, those terminals will cost about $349 each plus installation. So an electrician would have to install those. You're looking at about $700 um, for the terminals plus whatever the installation costs would be. And uh, a big shout out to Dustin Love because he performed all of the research related to how this could be converted to a pay for um, charge situation. So there's an app and it's called Shine Pay. If some of you have electric vehicles, you may be familiar with this. I do not, so I'm not familiar with it. But you can determine what the rate will be that you charge if you were to opt to go with this pay for service type situation. And then you can also establish time limits that individuals can utilize the station. You may establish it at one hour, two hour, three hours, four hours. Different types of electric vehicles require different types of charging depending on, you know, what that battery is and how long they're wanting that battery to last. Um, the payments can be set up to go directly to the city of Hopkinsville, but there is an administration fee that comes with that through the, the use of that application. And so it's a 3.9% transaction fee that would be reduced from uh, whatever that charging rate would be. And then there is a $10 per customer fee that would come out of that as well. And that is all that I have, Mr. Chairman, unless there are questions. Peg Hayes is also here. She is the chair of the Local Development Corporation. And um, hopefully between the, the four of us, we can answer any questions that you all may have. I do have a couple questions, Holly. Do we know how many people use this charger or does it not have that technology? It does not have that technology. Um, okay. They can look at the peaks in usage and correct me, Dustin, if I'm... I'm speaking out of term, but they can look at the peak hours as to when there is more electricity being used at that property, but there is not a mechanism for determining exactly how many individuals are using the terminal. So I would assume that that's a relatively small number. <coughs> Do we know? So the question that my constituent asked, she said, is it fair for the city to be putting fuel in someone who has an EV? But they don't do that for me because I can't afford an EV. So I guess that's the question to council. Is it fair for us to be subsidizing fuel for certain vehicles, but not for others? That's a question for council.
I don't think that's a fair comparison. I, I don't, I mean, I'm just thinking about our library presentation earlier. We provide services and I don't, I mean, it's, I don't, I mean, we, we just provide services as a city. I think the amount we're paying is so nominal. It's, it's small when we really look at the grand scheme of things that we can't look at it as free fuel because it's just not the same situation. I don't know. It's hard to explain my thoughts, I suppose. I just don't have a problem with it personally. <laughs> Am I looking at your numbers right, Holly? That if we <clears throat> if we were to actually charge for this, we'd be net negative by the time we charge a ten dollar per customer. It could be yes, yeah. sir, mm -hmm. depending I mean, on what rate you establish. Fee, we're net negative if we, if we charge, and I'm with you on that, Amy. That it's a it's a service that we provide, and it's it's kind of like a token of appreciation, you know, appreciation to the sudden service. So, mm -hmm. it's more of a historical yeah. site, I guess. So and the other the other issue I have with the building now, this building was redone. Three, four years ago? Yes, sir. So I, I did go down to the building, and I noticed that there is a significant amount of paint peeling underneath. Uh, and there is some places where the wood is, is rotting. I wouldn't have expected that after a refurbishment this quick, from my standpoint. Um, is that something that we're looking into? or? Yes, sir. It is. We have a bid opening scheduled for April the 13th to repair any of the rotten wood um, and replace where necessary, as well as to repaint the entire building. Um, all of the paint and all of the labor associated with painting that building was donated to us in 2019. Nice. That's all I've got. Uh, Ms. Francis. Could you uh, refresh everyone's memory as the reason that previous administrator decided to turn it into a charge station for the purpose? Yes, ma'am. Um, his thought process, as he explained it to the local development corporation, was that since the Sudden Service Station was the first gas station located in the city of Hopkinsville, that it would be really nice to be able to utilize it as the city's first EV charging station as well. Mayor uh, Hendricks was trying to get us a gold star rating. We didn't actually think we'd get it from TV at that time. This was just one of those myriad things that we did to go for that rating. We thought it would do well for economic development recruitment. So he asked the LDC in decades of this. And the transaction fee is 3.9%. And then yes, there's sir. a $10 per charger customer fee? Yes, sir. So the electric company is charging the city $10. No, that would be no, if sir. we put the chargers on. If you, that if would, you, that's through the app that would actually administer mm -hmm. the, the, if we put a card or whatever. That, I, I if you, you transition. But that would be $10 per transaction per customer. And that's the, uh, the shine pay app right. charges right. that not HES. Right. I, I get yes, that. Yes, sir. But I'm just saying yes, that, sir. that would be the additional $10. fee. $10. <laughs> okay. I got you. So, is the customer charged the ten dollars a month, or is the city charged the ten dollars a month? My understanding is it's the city. It's, re it's no, taken. It's just, Jeff, can you just okay. just step up? Just it may make it a little easier. <laughs> Sorry. You showed up, you may as well get to come to the podium. <laughs> I dressed up to come down here. So there you go. I, you know, I, I just reiterating what Holly said. I know, um, went back and looked at some uh, initial conversations we had with the city at that time in 2019. And it's exactly as Holly said, the idea was um, if it was the first uh, uh, gas station, then maybe it could be that one. So it was a, kind of a trial to say what this new technology is coming along. And I, and I remember the question asked, what would be the most economical? And I said the most economical as far as initial construction was to install it as, as is. It's behind the existing meter. We don't have electrical cost. But I said we can buy these chargers and they can have a, an additional module that are the for the bill pays. So that's a third-party entity that would come in if you wanted to add that feature to that. But that... As additional costs, and at that time, based on what we knew about what how many electric vehicles were in town, come back to what we're talking about tonight, the cost of coming up with a bill would be greater than what it what it is at the present time. 
I will say there's different types. There's three levels of chargers. The, the level one is the 120 volt that you'll have in your home. You'll plug into a normal, a normal outlet. This was a level two. So you're probably looking anywhere from what, four to eight hours to full charge. And then what you see now, the latest technology level three, which is a, quite a bit of larger service entrance, larger transformers, pretty much a, a pretty a larger investment is what the quick chargers are that's probably 30 minutes or so. So that's what the latest technology is that you see more at some of the uh, larger um, municipals or urban areas that are installing these at uh, shopping centers and such. And so we picked that uh, at that time, that was the best technology that was out there, but things changed quite a bit. So it's a situation and a lot of it's governed also we're under TVA's governance. I know I mentioned that when we had a presentation in January. So TVA has certain guidelines on how you can pass these charges along. TVA does not let our customers resell electricity. So you, you don't have the option of saying if this customer uses X number of kilowatt hours, you can't resell electricity. So if you wanted to come up with a charge, which you're free to do, whether it's a dollar an hour, $5 an hour, $100 an hour, you're free to pick any type of charge that you want to, to bill on it, but then it goes back to does that does that uh, deter people from using it? So that's mm -hmm. that's the the back and forth that you go along with. So back to my original question: Is the ten dollars per customer is that for the customer to use the Shine Pay app? That would go to that third party uh, card uh, user machine uh, uh, entity. The mm -hmm. vendor would charge that. That would. That would basically separate, <clears throat> take Penner, or Hopkinsville Electric Systems billing out of the equation, and you would. Uh, you, that's a way for the city to collect the charge on that. Right now, you have one meter, as Holly mentioned, that collects, that reads electricity on the building, the lights, all the facilities in it, the sign, and the charger. All that are behind that particular meter. So that this char, this uh, bill pay type system would be a way for the if the city chose to, to recoup that component of that, that charge, you, you would still get a bill from us, but you would be getting reimbursement when someone ran their credit card or, or debit card through that machine. Okay. Council member, Smiley. Well, my thoughts on it is, if someone owns an electric car in Hopkinsville, they're more likely gonna plug it up at home. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna take it out there and sit and wait for four hours, eight hours for it to go. <laughs> right. So I see it as, mostly going to be used as somebody coming into town, so. that, a tourist or somebody coming in um, to buy something in Hopkinsville to use. And I think since the charge uh, the, the that it's costing us is negligible enough that if it is people from out of town coming in, then we're, the city is more than making up for that small cost. Great point. Mm -hmm. Anything else on this? All right. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Councilman Crabtree for bringing this up. Um, Holly, thank you very much. Yes, and sir. I, I want to say thanks uh, for showing up tonight. Peg Hayes gave up a lot of her time to come uh, for the LDC. And, of course, Jeff and Dustin in the back. Thank you all for showing up for this as well. Uh, moving along to new business, going to call on Mr. Mike Perry, tough back to follow behind Mr. Hudson. I know do the best you can, talking about our parks and recreation truck purchase. All right, well, I, I volunteered to do this. Uh, of course, uh, I don't know why. I should let Tab Robin do it, but oh well. <laughs> well, we didn't know if he'd get here on time. <laughs> this won't take long. Uh, but, but back in uh, uh, last year, last June, City Council approved a truck, pickup truck, a half ton pickup truck for parks and rec. And at that time, we budgeted 40000 for that pickup truck, and that was about the cost of the truck at that time. Of course, everybody knows inflation's gone up, uh, cost of vehicles, everything's gone up. So uh, so we've been waiting on that vehicle since July. We had it on order since July of 2022. Well, it's available now, but the price has gone up about $5,000. Uh, so we're requesting for a $5,000 budget amendment for that capital pickup truck for the Parks and Rec. Uh, well, we can go ahead and move forward and get that for the Parks and Rec, and that should wind up the vehicle replacement for parks and rec for many years. This actually is, is replacing a 2000, a 2000 model GMC. Any questions for 
I'd like to make a motion. We forward this to council. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second on the floor. We've got Mr. Craig and Mr. Martin. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anything under other tonight? Anybody got anything? Seeing none, uh, we will entertain a motion, motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Let's go, uh, Martin and Craig. Everybody have a good evening.